Well, September deer hunting chores, are you ready? There's a lot to do in September. It seems like a lot of times you get to this point in the season, you're just trying to pull everything together. I have a lot going on with the farm here in Minnesota, over on the land in, in Wisconsin that we hunt, and uh, let alone preparations for just playing shooting and planning hunts for the fall. And I uh, really want to get out and hunt some public land areas in Pennsylvania and Michigan this year, and I intend to do so. But there's a lot to do. And hopefully, if you've been keeping up with the deer hunting chores all season long, you're to the point right now where you're just, again, trying to tie those things together. Maybe you have to throw a lot into September. And I think because I'm throwing a lot into September a lot of times, this list is long. There's 11. So I'm going to try to breeze through these really quick, not give it too much explanation. But there's a lot to do. And, uh, and I think... You know we're gonna we're gonna get this out right on September 1st or close to it so we right at the beginning of the month and there's certain things you should be doing towards the beginning of the month versus the end and, and number one right here is no exception it's last minute stand clearing especially your rut stands there's a lot of times I'm not going into a rut stand which would be a morning stand until the end of October October 20th October 25th when I get that end of October cold front I'm gonna go in there when that morning low is lower than it's been for several days or a week or more, maybe even the entire hunting season, and you're getting those first lows in the upper 20s, low 30s, and there's a significant change from one day versus the next. So I'm going on that frosty, toe-numbing morning and getting out there, and so I'm not gonna be in those stands for a while. And so to get back in there, get it all set, and early September versus late September, I'm not going back into that stand for six, seven weeks at the earliest. And some of those I won't even go until early November. So I'm going to get those, get into those, get them set, and then I'm not going back in at all. It's interesting, some of my uh, early season stands that are closer related to evening food source movements, uh, maybe a transition area in the morning off the side, although those are rare. Those are stands that I can go in there, and if things aren't perfect, I can adjust them, bring a saw the next time, whatever, uh, make them just right. Um, and you have a little bit of window there, a little gray area. Uh, those aren't necessarily the areas where I'm really getting serious and hunting uh, more towards a rut and when I expect great movement. So a little bit of time to play around with, especially those rut stands and getting it done early in September. And for some of you, the season's open in September, so you might not have those rut stands in areas where you can actually get, in, get into and potentially not spook deer uh, for, this, for this early part of the season. Number two, this is really important. We talk about this just alone in another video, but stretching your yardage out, this is at a point where you should feel pretty good with your, with your yardage, with uh, shooting, your groups, your muscles are feeling pretty good. It's a great time to stretch your yardage. And what I mean is if you plan to shoot 30 yards in the woods, great to shoot back to 60 yards, 50 yards if you can. Really double that distance. Not that you expect to shoot that in the woods, but if you shoot a lot further than you expect, I've been teaching that and writing about it for years. I have stretch your archery limit. I mean, that's an article I wrote probably 2010, 2008, somewhere around in there. But really, that's helped me. That's why I talk about it with you guys and write about it. But stretching your yardage, shoot sitting down, practice shooting sitting down. That's an incredible uh, piece of advice. Um, keep you more motionless in the stand. You shouldn't be really standing to hunt for long periods of time unless you want to give your rear end a, um, a break. And then, of course, practicing that straight pull, where instead of that sky draw like this, it saves your muscles. Make sure you're you're not overbowed so that you can actually pull, aim at the, the deer, and pull straight back in the stand. That'll allow a lot less motion. And for those of us that hunt in more high pressure states and not the fantasy land states, any less movement we can make in the trees is a great idea and that'll help you get your deer. These are three practice pieces for bow hunting very quickly that you can utilize and make sure that you're on track for making a great shot this fall. Number three, September is a great time for layering rye. You know, I use the green blends of uh, beans, peas, late planted buckwheat, tillage radish, oats, and then I plan to top dress it with rye. Now, if you're in a Northern state, Labor Day, the 10th of September is a great time. I'm usually utilizing 200 pounds per acre and I'm spreading it over those greens that I just talked about, that half of my plot. At the same time, you might have, if you go out and notice your radish is a little thin, then really right now in early September, you can put some tillage radish into those areas. So if your brassica is a little thin, which brassicas include rape, 
turnip, radish, kale, canola, whatever it might be. But you're looking at and then say, okay, there's some light areas. I had some bare areas. I just went in and reseeded right now. It's August 24th. Just because they are sun exposed, we got a, a little bit of rain for germination, then no rain for two weeks. So unless there was some thatch or it was in a shady area, I didn't get great grass, brassica growth. I got good brassica growth overall, especially in the areas that had uh, the heavier buckwheat. But I just went in there with tillage radish, and tillage radish is going to go about six, seven pounds per acre. And what's nice about the tillage radish is that it's a very fast germinating brassica, grows quickly, helps the soil. So it's a great fill, and I actually did that with my corn last year in bare spots as I got into August and September. So great time for planned rye layering or filling in with the radish. And that leads to number four, plot salvage. Don't ever take a soil dried out, browsed out plot into the hunting season. There's just no excuse for it. Instead, if you're looking at this failed food plot, don't get too down. Just take 200 pounds of rye or wheat towards the early September if you're in one of these northern states. If you're in more of a southern area, and I'm not saying too far, you know, too far southern, but uh, southern Ohio, southern Indiana, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, over to Oklahoma, southern Illinois, on that line, You'd look at more mid-September, and if you went down to Louisiana, Alabama, and, and, and further south, you might look at more towards the end of September, but it's at 200 pounds per acre. You're just spreading it right over the top, and an Earthway Model 2750, that's opening it wide open and just spreading it. Just a nice, even walking pace, and cranking that at a nice, even pace, and that'll be about the right amount per acre. When you're doing that, look at those beginning times that I talked about from north to south, and use a sliding scale as you get progressed closer to about four weeks after that. For example, where I'm at, early September versus end of September, October 1st, I'm going to slant that from 200 pounds of winter rye or wheat per acre to 300 pounds with the thought that you're not going to get good overall growth four weeks later. And so you want to put that on a lot heavier so you fill space horizontally, meaning you're putting more stems on the ground. So when you look at the ground, it looks more like a sod base. So you're giving the deer more, more amount and volume per every bite. Now, I recommend using rye over wheat. The reason is because rye is much less discriminant on soil types. Wheat needs a little bit heavier soil, better pH. Wheat is more readily available. So sometimes it might come down to wheat's all you can find. That's okay. Rye grows in colder temperatures than wheat, germinates in colder temperatures. Also, if you look at rye the following year during its growth phase, rye will get to five, six feet tall. And in a lot of places, wheat will get to three or four feet tall. So there's a big difference in overall volume and height. So I recommend rye because it's less soil discriminant. You're trying to do a plot salvage. You're just getting it on the ground. And in the end, while deer might prefer oats, over wheat, over rye, or whatever that is, there's not, they're not going to notice that difference when you have that beautiful green carpet that has been used to fill in a food plot or a failed food plot. So there's no right answer. There's no to say that wheat is better than rye in every circumstance or rye is better than wheat. I recommend rye just because we're looking at a fail safe at this point. We're just looking at something that's going to grow and will give you your best chance with the best volume that late in the season and typically that's rye unless you can't find it in your area so but look at that taking place in september or starting in september now years ago a man named ed spinazola i referred to him as the father of modern food plotting back in the 90s but ed talked about putting 75 pounds of urea per acre on brassicas about four to six weeks in growth and i love doing that practice i practice that still today 75 pounds of urea per acre, it'll give you about 40 pounds of nitrogen per acre, right around there. So I'm spreading that on the brassica. The brassica has to be dry. So you can't do this when it's a morning dew or just finished a rain, because it's gonna burn the leaves. And you wanna do this when you see appreciable rain in the forecast, so you don't lose the urea that's just laying on the ground and it volatizes and goes into the air, doesn't go into the ground and help your crops. So I, after, and there's, you can look up some of the charts online, but, 80 degree temperatures, 90 degree temperatures, the hotter it is, the faster that will volatize, you lose nitrogen if it just lays on the ground. So you want rain within a few days. Um, you wanna make sure it's not wet, it's dry. And that's been a great practice to hit and to offer nitrogen at the middle of the growth phase for brassica. You're, it's starting to experience exponential growth at year four or week four to six. So you're looking to hit that exponential growth phase and give it the nitrogen it needs to uh, put on a lot of volume and uh, attraction. Number six, plot boost. We use plot boost from Deer Grow. We use plot start to begin with. 
when those plants are in that four to six week phase, then we'll use plot boost. So that's something that we're going to do likely next Monday, Tuesday, when Dylan's here next and filming. Uh, it's pouring rain out here right now. <laughs> so we'll get that in next time. Uh, we had some other things we wanted to do outside today, but I'm not going to complain about the rain. We had a little bit of drought. So, but plot boost is used in the middle of the growth phase to keep those nutrients high in the plants, allow those plants to uptake those nutrients and uh, give your healthier, lusher, greener, more attractive food plot. And I believe in it and that's why we're putting it down. Number seven, frost seeding. Frost seeding switchgrass. Now, if you're in more of a Northern state, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, over into uh, Michigan, uh, I would look at any time after Labor Day, if you have open bare soil, you're getting to a point where the temperatures are going down enough at night to where the soil temperature is not there. You're not going to get germination on your switchgrass. So I look at any time from after Labor Day, again, those southern states are looking more towards October 1st, but there's a, and a window in there where you can actually frost seed switchgrass on bare soil that you're planning on growing the next spring. A lot of people do that with their lawn. I've seen people seed their lawns in October, November, and that's not necessarily a bad practice because then it's ready, viable, and, and able to germinate as soon as the soil temperatures and moisture hit that, that uh, hot spot in the spring the following year. So a uh, great time for switchgrass. And if you're in if you're really worrying about that, then just wait till February, March. I encourage you to frost seed with no snow because there are times where there's ice in the ground. I've seen it many times where seed switch, switch grass washes to one side or the other. And especially with the hills around here, uh, we wanna wait till after snow is out and we get that seed on the soil. And you're gonna have plenty of time to, to uh, frost seed and get good germination, even if it's in March next year. But all the way from, especially middle of September, all the way through the following March is a great window to frost seed. Um, in most states. Number eight, cell cam time. Dylan uh, reminded me of this. Now, I, I have cell cameras out all the time because um, that's what I do for a living. You know, that's something that I enjoy uh, keeping tabs on, moving them around, watching how deer react in water holes, mock scrapes, and starting to get an inventory of bucks. But really those bucks, especially in their fall shift, the annual whitetail shift, is not taking place until mid-September early to where they're actually locking into that fall range but mid-September to mid-October. So early September, mid-September is a great time to get your cell plans going, to start kicking out that monthly bill, to get the batteries and the camera. And what's nice about September is most of the models and we use excess render, those excess renders are great because if I put eight AA lithium batteries in mid-September, the earliest I'm changing those is mid-November or later, maybe early December. And that's only because I want to keep them running non-stop. I keep mine out in the field a lot and probably more than I should. Probably most, most of the year, someone been out there all year. Um, but I want those to run for a solid three to four months before I change batteries. And uh, September's a great time to, and I need to go do that right now, but I'm going to be changing a lot of batteries early September. I'll just go around and change them all so that I can get a really clean look going into the fall. And, uh, and if you're out there and you're trying to save uh, money, great time to get your cell plans going right now on those cameras. Number nine, and this could be important any time of the year, but really start watching the weather. We used HuntCast. I helped develop the HuntCast and the algorithm that goes with it through HuntWise. So the HuntWise app, HuntCast, that's part of me. Again, I'm gonna talk about it a lot because it is part of me. I've worked with HuntWise a lot in putting this together. And it's my algorithm I developed for Outdoor Life, November rut issue in 2015. I urge you to check that out if you can find it. But this is a way that I've hunted for 30 years and it just simply works. It helps you maximize your time. That's why I started hunting this way, is I wanted to make sure I was efficient with not only my time in the woods, but also my time with family, with kids, and my career. So it was a great way to help me balance everything and to get the most out of each category. So that's why I urge you to look at this. But whether it's September scouting, September hunting, uh, great to begin that process, if you haven't already, of watching the weather. And it's pretty cool because all summer long, I can see on those low value days when it's hot and windy, we're not getting buck pictures. When you get those cold fronts that have come through, we're getting a lot of rain. I don't know if you heard some thunder earlier, but we're getting a lot of rain and thunder right now, lightning. I guarantee if we get cooler temperatures tonight, it's supposed to drop in temperature tomorrow morning. We'll get some great buck movement tomorrow morning. I can't wait to see that on the cell cams, but you can get instant information. You're saying, okay, the weather is supposed to be good. You're seeing that on a hunt cast. 
you see it on your cell cam. So it's a pretty cool process to follow. Number 10, September is an outstanding time. I've been doing this for over 15 years for filling your water holes. If you use a 100, 110 gallon tank to 150 like I recommend, then filling those full right now, it's very rare that you don't get enough rain in September, October to keep those full or keep at least keep the water appreciable. We didn't fill ours at all last year and in, and in Wisconsin when we had that drought, it really hurt us. So we had full water of course in the spring and then we had good rain throughout and then all of a sudden those last couple months it got dry. So we watched bucks falling into the tank trying to get some water and jumping out and you know kind of comical to see but they're really trying to get that water it was important to them at that time of year because everything was so dry had we filled those in september we would have been golden with some of those spots i can't imagine the kind of sits we could have had when they were actually even just a half full or third full so we didn't do a good job i find that filling the water holes i've only had to do that once every two or three years 2020 was one of those years 2016 was another year uh, Dylan has some footage he shared recently on a video where it was 2016 just going from memory I think it was October 22nd I was in there filling it or October 23rd and the next day or two days later there's a really nice 10.4 year old that we hadn't seen before coming right into that water hole it was 10 o'clock and that's about that time when they start putting a priority on water and if you fill them in September you don't have to worry about it number 11 last minute pee what do I mean by that your mock scrapes if you put them out in June like I recommend got a camera on them this is a time to make sure they haven't grown over in any weeds you're raking them just kicking out the weeds and grasses under them make sure your camera has battery nearby making sure the tree stand that's looking over that mock scrape is good and while you're there you might as well urinate on it I don't even know if it works or not but what I do think it does is the deer see that clear dirt patch they smell the urine in it they're, it's, they're never going to be alarmed because it's your urine, but what they are going to do is it's curiosity, the mock scrapes there, the hanging vine, they hit it, they keep hitting it, they keep adding scent with their preorbital glands on that mock scrape vine, and it continues the process. So we have a long list of things to do in September. I hope you guys are caught up. There's probably a lot of you out there that already have all this stuff done, and uh, props to you, that's awesome. And, uh, you know, just enjoy this time because once we get into October, things really heat up. And it, I say enjoy this time because this is someone that's gone through over three decades of deer seasons and uh, in that hopeful approach. It's here and gone before we know it, before we know it. So make sure you enjoy it this season and that you've completed these September deer chores or you have good plans to do so so that you can be on track to having a great hunt this fall. Well, I'm real excited, folks. I appreciate you watching this video, but my next web class, How to Plant Food Plots, How to Design Your Food Plot Program is out. And uh, it really goes through a step-by-step -step process for not only how to plant your food plots, but why you should plant them, where you should plant them, what you should plant, how you should create them. There's a lot of different modules. Ends up about 30 videos all together. I urge you to check that out. We're out here completing our food plot work today and we do that in a pretty strict pattern so we can find success this fall food plots shouldn't be a guessing game take the guesswork out of food plots and food plots planting and uh and check out the web classes i have my how to design your whitetail property the food plots for the next web class in the series and i hope you enjoy it i hope you check it out and uh let me know what you think if you uh, end up purchasing that and i think you'd be well pleased that you did